it's a great yeah. privilege to welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Gauss to the uh, to this session uh, where where we are going off the of the resident smart learning program for today. And uh, Dr. Gauss, I have had the privilege of knowing for uh, for quite some time. He's uh, he's a fantastic surgeon. Uh, he has been a practicing urologist from 2013, and uh, he's worked. Uh, he's he's working now as a senior consultant in the uh, in the Asian Institute of Nephrology, and uh, he he is both a robotic and a laparoscopic surgeon and a special interest in in ureteric strictures. And I myself have, have has had the uh, privilege of seeing a lot of his. Uh, surgery's live stream and he has had original contributions in the in both uh, the laparoscopic techniques of of VVF and and also in laparoscopic nephrectomy and uh, he's also done an, a, many publications on uh, robotic and open uh, uterocalicostomy it is my privilege today to welcome dr gauss uh, to our resident smart resident learning program today and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so very much for the kind words, sir. Over to Lakshman, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chawla, Madam, President Kulkarni, and uh, Arbin. In fact, I was just wondering the relevance of this topic to the residents, sir. But then uh, I must say here that the, this is a procedure, a ureteroscopy is a procedure which is given to the residents maybe by the time they are in the second year or when they are in the third year. And the gentleness is something which has to be uh, emphasized here. I remember a professor of mine always used to say when it came to endoscopy, one has to be extremely gentle unless you are an expert. That was the writer used to put. And when somebody had asked him, sir, what about an expert? He said, the expert will always be gentle. So that's the message. And then there is a very famous line that the endoscopist's uh, ego should be one third of the diameter of the, the tubular viscous he is going to, he or she is going to manipulate. And today, I think if somebody said that tuberculosis is the commonest cause of ureteric stricture, I'm afraid I think, you know, the examiner may not be very happy. So unless we factor in the iatrogenic causation, uh, it's, uh, it's tough, it is, you know, not considered competency. So, and it is that gentleness and the techniques, the preventions, and when it occurs rarely, you know, you have to see to it that it occurs rarely. And when it occurs rarely, how to go about it. And there is always a ostrich like Thanks. approach when it is your own procedure. I'm sure uh, Dr. Gauss will agree with me that if I've done the ureteroscopy and if the patient has de developed a stricture, I have an ostrich like, a, no, it can't, it can't be me. So one should keep an open mind when it comes to evaluation. And uh, anything that uh, can go wrong should be evaluated uh, with, uh, with meticulously. And then uh, we must apply the corrective intervention and the measures. With this, I would request uh, the Indian school to take over. And then maybe it's time for us all to become all ears and listen to one of our dear colleagues, Dr. Mohamed Gauss, who is such a popular teacher and a facilitator both uh, in the conferences workshops and uh, during our uh, Euromed programs. I'm extremely delighted to be here and I bring warm greetings from all in the USI Council. Thank you Indian School and over to whomsoever is going to come after me, the speaker or the Indian School for a few more remarks. Thank you very much. I Arvind, uh, we have to invite uh, Dr. Kulkarni for presidential remarks today. Yes, yes, sir. yes. Sir. Uh, it's a great privilege to have uh, Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, president of USI here, and uh, it's an absolute privilege to invite him to for a few remarks. This is a topic I'm sure which is very close to his heart. He is he is a reconstructive uh -huh. surgeon by excellence. So your 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 kind words, please. Thank, thank you, Dr. Arvind. Uh, uh, Mohammed Gauss is my favorite laparoscopic surgeon in the country. Whenever he, is, uh, he or Malikarjun are demonstrating surgery, uh, I'm always enthralled by their skills and the way they handle the tissues. Now, I just want to say that uh, every year now, last few years, we have been doing about four to six buccal mucosa ureteroplasties um, because of the 
uh, what you call silent death of a kidney after ureteroscopy, and this is becoming quite common. So I request all my urology colleagues to um, do a uh, follow-up ultrasound scan after DJ stent removal to check that the kidneys are okay. And Mamad is going to show us uh, how he follows the patient and how he treats them. So welcome, Dr. Gauss. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Can I start, sir? Yes, please. Yeah. 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 Please, yeah. Gauss, please. Thank you so much uh, for your kind words and this gentle introduction, sir. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, just confirm whether I'm uh, visible. My screen is visible now. Yes, of course. Yeah, very clearly. Thank you, sir. Uh, I bring greetings from my institute, Asian Institute of Nephrology and Urology here in uh, Hyderabad. And uh, I also would like to thank at the outset uh, ISU USI for this uh, opportunity. And um, such kind and encouraging words by our uh, secretary and president, sir. And thank you, Varun Panda, sir, for the, the kind introduction. As we all know, and just uh, as we have been, uh, you know, highlighted that it's the uh, endourologist who is at stake here. All are. I'm not able to minimize this. Are you able to see my entire screen, sir? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, able to yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we are all uh, basically endourological uh, surgeons primarily, and the commonest procedure we do as a urologist is ureteroscopy. And the ureteric stricture is a direct complication, and that can lead to a loss of renal unit when not timely attended. And that's what uh, has been highlighted by our president also where he says uh, we need to do an ultrasound regularly post uh, any procedure, ureteroscopy, to check where, whether the uh, patient has developed any hydronephrosis post-procedure. For any stricture in the ureter, I'll not uh, discuss about the pathophysiology of the ureteric stricture, rather I would uh, only discuss about the surgical management. Initial management for any ureteric stricture would be an endoscopic management again. But none of the studies have shown that this is going to be a permanent solution. This is definitely a solution, but not a permanent solution. So initial management would be stenting, then uh, di balloon dilatation, endourotomy or a endopilotomy. This is all uh, we initially try and uh, try to tide over the situation whether, whether uh, the patient comes with sepsis or pain or any, any other symptomatic uh, condition. But the final <clears throat> would be a surgical management and a definitive therapy. So what are the principles? The principles of any reconstructive surgery for any luminal structure is a restoration of the ureteral lumen, primary anastomosis or a substitution with a flap or a graft, and stents obscure the delineation between the strictured and the non-strictured segment. Hence, it's always better to not to have a stent because that causes periureteric fibrosis and fixes the ureter to the psoas muscle and the surrounding structures. And whenever you remove a stent, always have a PCN across so that the stricture is delineated very well and you also have a drainage for the kidney and prevents this uh, loss. So what are the factors that decide the management of a ureteric stricture? It depends on the location of the stricture, where the stricture is located, how far away from the pelvis or the bladder it is, the length of the stricture segment, whether it's a short segment uh, stricture where the ends can be brought together or it's a long segment stricture wherein we need to augment it or take some flap. The ureteric redundancy proximal to the level of obstruction, the bladder capacity so that the bladder can be utilized for any reconstructive purpose, bowel health, if at all, uh, you know, you one need to be aware whether the patient has got any inflammatory bowel disease or previous surgeries. All these factors decide how we manage these ureteric strictures. Coming to what, so, uh, what uh, treatment is uh, planned for uh, different levels of stricture. If it is a distal uh, ureteric stricture, one can plan a ureteric knee implant in the form of a psoas hitch. If it is a mid ureter at the level of the sacroiliac joints, one can plan a bori flap. If it is a proximal ureteric stricture, if it is a, a narrow, a, a small annular stricture, ureter ureterostomy can be done. If it is a long segment proximal ureteric stricture, BMG, ureteroplasty can be done or a long bori flap can be fashioned. A full length ureteric stricture of the upper ureter can be managed by a ileal interposition. 
if the stitcher is only at the level of the pelvic rotator junction a bmg augmentation at the puj or a ureter callicostomy as a salvage procedure can be performed coming to a different scenarios with all the stitches at different levels how they are managed we can be discussing in the form of clinical scenarios here i'll discuss a distal ureteric stitcher wherein a young female who had a URSL for a distal ureteric calculus, a VOJ calculus for which she had undergone a URSL. On present, I mean, she presented with pain abdomen and fever post stent removal. Multiple stent exchanges were done outside, but they failed and was planned for a retrograde uh, pilography and proceed. This is a CT scan image showing gross hydroureteronephrosis. That is a dilated proximal ureter just, be just before the ureteric stricture, which is just at the level of the VUJ. One can see the reconstructive image very clearly. And this is an RGP picture wherein a short segment a distal ureteric stricture, probably an intramural and just extramural part of the ureter being uh, totally strictured, only allowing the dye to go in. So what are the deciding factors here in the management? It is a short segment stricture, only the distal ureter is involved, the bladder capacity is good, and it's an endoluminal, endoluminal procedure that has positive stricture. So you do not expect any periuretric or a perivesical pathology here. This is a video of a laparoscopic right ureteric reimplantation with a psoas hitch. It starts with identification of the stricture, mobilization of the ureter. The standard laparoscopic ports are planned for any pelvic surgery. Here, the distal ureter is being dissected as low as possible, sometimes beyond the level of the stricture if possible. That is the distal most ureter being dissected out. One can see the dilated proximal part with the strictured part still, which can be used at a, as a handle to manipulate the ureter till it is reimplanted. One has to be very careful as to how long the ureter is being mobilized. It is always better whenever you are planning a distal ureteric uh, reimplantation to have the common iliac supply of the ureter intact. That is not to mobilize the ureter beyond the level of the common iliacs to prevent a devascularization of this ureter. Once you have mobilized the ureter, the next step would be identification and dropping of the urinary bladder. The lateral extent of the bladder drop is going to be the obliterated umbilical arteries on either side. The best energy source that I prefer would be a monopolar cautery with the scissors, wherein you can go in this loose areolar tissue all around the bladder, not to go towards the anterior uh, rectus sheath or the bladder uh, muzzle, but to go in this loose areolar tissue, which is always present in any virgin bladder. If you have to mobilize a bladder towards the area of uh, repair, it's always uh, prudent to divide the obliterated umbilical artery on the opposite side if it is not easily coming towards the site of operation. That releases the tension onto the opposite side. One can see that the bladder is easily coming onto the psoas onto the ipsilateral side. Once this is done, the complete bladder drop, one can further dissect the bladder and divide the opposite superior vesical artery also in situations where it deserves. The second important tip here is to have the bladder semi-filled and it is always better to keep a Foley's catheter, wide bore Foley's catheter along with a feeding tube in the bladder so as to fill and to empty the bladder whenever required. This is a psoas stitch being taken superficially and through the psoas tendon and so that the bladder gets fixed to the lateral pelvic wall at this, at this point. Care has to be taken not to involve the genetic femoral nerve and if taken deep can also involve the femoral nerve. So it has to be very superficial. At the same time, not to prevent it cut through. Two to three sutures are being taken. The bladder wall is fixed to the lateral, lateral wall. Once this is done, the ureter is placed onto the bladder and in a semi-filled bladder, uh, incision is being given along the long axis of the ureter so as to reach the mucosal surface. Again, it's a practice to use a monopolar cautery so that there is not any bleeding and you can see the mucosa without any hindrance. 
if we have a blind cut, we, we can we can see a lot of bleeders and the mucosal surface which we need to dissect out for a, a non-reflexing uh, anastomosis is obscured. One has to have one has to create a sufficient tunnel submucosally on all sides so as to accommodate this dilated ureter in that submucosal tunnel. A sufficient length of this only detrosar uh, incision is ascertained. The ureter is again brought back to its position and the distal most handle which we have been using all this while to hold is now divided and the proximal dilated ureter is seen very clearly. Once the ureteric stricture end is divided, it is taken for histopathology and this divided ureter is got near the distal most part of this bladder opening. A mucosa is now open. One can see that the counter of the bladder is still maintained because it is a semi-filled bladder and doesn't collapse back into the deep pelvis. The first stitch is taken at the distal most part of our uh, dissection in the bladder and the, the distal most part of the ureter is now fixed at that point. Once this is fixed, one more suture is taken at the proximal opening of the ureter. to the cranial most opening of the mucosal incision. Now that the ureter is fixed at these two points, it is now sutured medially and laterally like how we do in a pyeloplasty. Either it can be an interrupted or a continuous suture. One can continue suturing the lateral all the medial aspect of this ureter to the mucosa. Once one wall is done, a stent is placed across and the rest of the closure of the ureter to the bladder mucosa is done. This is the closure of the bladder mucosa to the ureter. Once the both the sites anastomosis of the ureter to the bladder mucosa is done, a fixation sutures of the ureter onto the serous of the bladder is done so as to prevent any tension onto the anastomosis. Once this is done, a detrosaraphy is commenced and the bladder is closed over the invaginated ureter. till its entry where it enters the bladder in the submucosal tunnel. This completes the ureteric reimplantation in a very distal ureteric structure. The lateral rent is now closed to prevent any internal herniation. Coming to the next scenario of a long segment distal ureteric stricture. Here again, one more scenario of a young female who has got an impacted large distal ureteric calculus who has undergone URSL and stenting. Post stent removal, she complains of pain abdomen and on investigation has found to be having a long segment distal ureteric stricture. This is a uh, CT reconstruction of the ureteric stricture and an RGP on table just before the procedure showing a Stricture at the level of the sacroiliac joint. So here the deciding factors as to what we need to plan to uh, treat the stricture surgically is that it's a long stricture. It's over the sacroiliac joint. So we cannot plan a re-implant in this uh, case. And bladder capacity has to be good. And again, it's a post endoluminal procedure stricture. So we don't expect much of a periuretric fibrosis here. Here again, the ureter is mobilized at the level of the iliacs. As much distally as possible, the ureter is being dissected. Once that is done, the bladder is now dropped. And you can see that a sufficiently distended bladder is seen. The defect is now measured from the level where the bladder gets reflected anteriorly till the defect of the ureter. The base of the flap that is planned onto the bladder is now measured. And a flap is fashioned in such a way that the length of the flap 
equalizes, equalizes the length of the defect between the ureter and the bladder flap. It's always prudent to follow the 3 is to 1 uh, ratio for the length to the base of the flap for having a better vascularity on a bore flap. Again, a monopolar scissors to divide the, uh, the muzzle part of the bladder and a scissors with a cold cut for the mucosal part of the bladder. The ureter is now divided, the distal most part, strictured part being taken for a biopsy and that is the bore flap of, of the bladder got near the ureteric uh, end without any tension. It's always better to create a tubular structure of this flap first so as to have a lumen to lumen anastomosis at the level of the ureter. One can also start at the level of the flap uh, end and then go beyond towards the bladder. A V-lock suture is uh, used to close the bladder and an interrupted vicryl is used to tubularize the bladder to, uh, to prevent ischemia of the flap. Once the tubularized flap is got near the end of the ureter, an end-to-end -end spatulated anastomosis with the ureter is being done now. Once a wall of this ureteric anastomosis is done, a stent is passed across and then distally into the bladder and the rest of the bladder flap is now closed. This is the ureteric anastomosis and the rest of the bladder closure is done using the V-lock suture. One can have a single layer closure with a 2-0 V-lock or a double layer closure with a 3-0 V-lock. To prevent undue tension onto this anastomosis, the bladder is now fixed to the psoas again and also to occlude the lateral space to prevent internal herniation. That is the end of the bore flap. A small modification of this bore flap is having a smiley incision so that the principle of bore flap remains the same but you have a very wide base so we cannot expect any ischemia of the flap that we need to take. And there is inline closure of the bladder along the long axis of the ureter. This is a small video of this modification wherein the peritoneal incision is being given on the ureter. Identifying the area, again majority of this a kind of a flap is taken whenever you have a stricture at the level of the iliac uh, crossing. Anything proximal to this, one needs to have a long bore flap. So one now that you have identified the level of obstruction or the stricture, the bladder is again dropped. The principle remains same the, of the bladder drop. The ureter is now divided. And one can see the nicely bleeding ureteric end. A point quartry is done to prevent any bleeding and that is the wide base flap onto the bladder. That is the incision onto the bladder initially with a quartry and then deepened with the scissors onto the mucosa. That is the bladder flap easily reaching the end of the divided ureter. Outside in, inside out suture at the level of the first bite. That is the tension free anastomosis being commenced at the level of the flap and the divided ureter. One can see that the bladder flap is quite thick and wide base. So we do not expect any ischemic stricture at the level of the anastomosis at a later date. The rest of the suturing at the level of the anastomosis and the bladder is, remains the same. Once the posterior wall is done, a stent is passed across, again through the contralateral one of the ports and a free movement of the stent is ascertained. And the bladder closure is commenced. Once few interrupted sutures are taken at the distal end, distal most end of the flap, the rest of the bladder closure again can be done through a V-lock suture.
Similarly, the internal herniation again is prevented here by attaching this uh, anastomosis to the lateral pelvic wall peritoneum. That completes the management of strictures for distal ureter, either they being a short segment or a long segment ureteric strictures. The similar techniques can be done in an open or a robotic uh, manner also. Coming to short segment upper ureteric strictures. Here again, a scenario is explained wherein a young male doctor, he uh, himself being a radiologist, presented with a flank pain after an RIRS, which was done for a renal pelvic calculus. He was evaluated with a retrograde pyelography, which was not even admitting a guide wire or a dye beyond the level of the stricture. There was proximal uh, hydronephrosis with a redundant ureter. So here the deciding factors for doing the de definitive procedure is short segment annular narrowing of the upper ureter and again a post endurological procedure stricture. Here a robotic manip uh, manipulation is being done. The upper ureter is mobilized. This is the left sided upper ureter being mobilized. This is going to be a limited mobilization wherein that annular narrowing is very clearly visualized. Spatulation of the distal ureter is being done medially. That is a strictured segment that is being divided. Once the strictured segment is divided, the proximal gushing of saline or, or uh, uh, the urine is coming very clearly. And the spatulation and the upper part of it is done in the lateral aspect. It is always good not to divide completely both the ends so that they snap away from each other. It is always good to have this ends attached and take a suture so that you can approximate them without any tension before you divide the strictured segment. Once the suture is being taken, the division of the strictured segment is being done now. And this strictured segment is taken for a biopsy. One can see that the edges of the both the ureteric ends are coming in very freely and that is a parapical suture, suture being taken from the distal uh, most ureter to the proximal ureter. The V of this part going and sitting uh, comfortably in the divided upper ureter. The similar way of uh, closure like a pyeloplasty wherein one wall is done and then a stent is passed and the the other wall of uh, this anastomosis is being completed. It's always good to do an interrupted suture rather than continuous suture whenever end-to-end -end ureter ureterostomy is being done to prevent ischemia. That is a completion of the posterior layer of the ureter ureterostomy. Stunt being passed from the medial opening. Coming to the next scenario of a long segment upper ureteric stricture. Herein, uh, you've got a, a middle-aged male who presented with left flank pain. He had a history of a URSL seven months back done elsewhere and patient was evaluated with an ultrasound IVP and which suggested a left mid ureteric stricture of a longer length. An RGP was done before the surgery and this is the RGP. One has to be very clear as to where the stricture lies and where it extends from. One can see that it is a very short segment stricture if you see the lumen part of it but one should also appreciate that the tapering starts half a centimeter or a centimeter away before the uh, illuminal tapering is happening. So the entire length of the stricture is slightly beyond what you see in or, on an RGP. And that's an IVP confirming the obstruction. So here the deciding factors that are, uh, it's a long segment stricture in the proximal ureter and you have a long tapering lumen or an, on an IVP. He was planned for a buccal mucosal graft ureteroplasty. And this is a video of a laparoscopic BMG being placed. The left-sided upper ureter being dissected. One can see that the dilated upper ureter is there. To identify the lower ureter and 
to delineate the stricture part, it is always good to have a ureteric catheter in the lower uh, ureter. One can distend the lower ureter and the upper ureter uh, can be delineated because of its hydronephrosis. Any buccal mucosal graft needs a base for its imbibition. And here we have a gerotus uh, fascia along with the perinephric fat itself for its vascularity. And a flap is being uh, lifted of this gerotus fascia and the perinephric fat away from the ureter. A longitudinal incision is given on the normal distal ureter. Once the lumen is identified, this incision is carried on onto the normal proximal ureter. That is a strictured segment. One can see the ureter catheter uh, through the lower incision. Just like in the urethra, a urethral plate has to be maintained for any buccal mucosal graft ureteroplasty as well. That is the anterior incision onto the ureter and then onto the proximal normal ureter. In the, same, in the same ureter catheter which was placed in the lower ureter is now passed onto the proximal ureter which acts as a measure as well as used for calibration of the proximal ureter as well. This is a buccal mucosal graft that is being harvested and fixed with a vicryl suture at its end so that it can easily be manipulated intraperitoneally and can be fixed at both the ends of the incision. That is the defined uh, buccal mucosal graft held with that uh, suture and taken into the abdomen. One end of it is fixed to the proximal part of the ureter through an in inside out suture so that the upper end is fixed. The lower end is again seen a similar way fixed at the distal most part of the ureteric opening. Once both the edges of this buccal mucosal graft are fixed, the rest of the suturing is on either walls of this opening. These two sutures stabilize the buccal mucosal graft for rest of the closure of the BMG to this ureteric edges. One can have a continuous running suture on one wall and few interrupted on the other wall or can have a continuous suture on either side. Full thickness sutures of the ureter with the BMG is being taken. And one can see that once the, uh, one of the wall is done, it is a wide open ureter with this buccal mucosal graft. A stent is placed distally and proximally pushed into the renal pelvis. And this graft is covered over this stent and fixed to the opposite wall of the ureter. Here it is being done with a monocryl suture in a continuous fashion. That's how the final look of a large uh, defect being done with the buccal mucosal graft ureteroplasty. The flap, the flap which we have uh, reflected off the gerotus fascia and the perinephric fat is now released back so that it covers the buccal mucosal graft completely. One can also get a momentum and wrap this uh, anastomosis which acts as a vascular uh, bed for it. This is a post-operative image showing uh, you know, nice drainage without hydronephrosis at the end of six months on an IVP. One more scenario is of a left, mid and a proximal ureter. For, uh, for that matter, the entire length of the ureter is strictured for a patient who had had a history of a URSL and RIRS four months back. An RGP was done with, which did not allow the uh, dye to go beyond the level of the VUJ itself and patient uh, was uh, put on a PCN. Nephrostogram showed a cutoff at the level of the PUJ itself and the rest of the ureter was not visualized. Bladder capacity was measured uh, with a cystogram and it showed a good bladder capacity. This patient was hence planned for an open bori, bori flap till the renal uh, pelvis. Here the deciding factors were full length loss of the ureteric uh, uh, lumen 
and a good bladder capacity was there and patient had a good renal functional unit on that side. An open bore flap is being shown here. The bladder being mobilized completely. One can see that a 15 cent, 12 to 15 centimeters of this flap on the bladder can reach till the renal pelvis given that the bladder capacity is sufficiently available. That is a wide base of this uh, flap over the bladder and reassuring again that the length of the stricture can be co compensated with this long bory flap. That is a flap being taken from the anterior wall onto the opposite side of the bladder. That is a long bory flap that is being tubularized now over an infant feeding tube. This tubul tubularized bory flap is now anastomosed to the renal pelvis over a digestant. The rest of the bladder closure and a SPC is then placed for a wider drainage. One more scenario is of a pelviuretic junction stricture. We have seen a distalvertic stricture, a midurotic short and long segment stricture, and now comes the pelviuretic junction strictures. Again, with a scenario of a middle-aged male who had a left flank pain and vomitings post PCNL for a calculus three years ago. His intravenous pyelography and a retrograde pyelography showed a stricture at the level of the PUJ with a cicatrized intrarenal pelvis. As we are aware that the pelvis is a posterior structure in the renal hilum, hence anteriorly approaching the cicatrized pelvis was not feasible. In this case, we have the deciding factors of a short segment stricture at the level of the PUJ with a cicatrized intrarenal pelvis and a thick parenchyma wherein we cannot think of a Urotracalicostomy. Hence, a robotic approach with mobilization of the kidney and flipping it medially so as to reach the pelvis posteriorly comfortably. Anteriorly, uh, cicatrized pelvis cannot be ac accessed easily. So, this is a flipped kidney, the ureter identified, longitudinal incision extended onto the renal pelvis and onto the normal ureter down below. The distal ureter is now calibrated with an IFT and the length of the defect is being measured. A stunt is placed and this defect is now augmented with a buccal mucosal graft again in the posterior aspect. The robotic technique here helps in maintaining the position of the kidney as well as taking uh, sutures in this difficult position in a flipped kidney at the level of the PUJ and placing this graft comfortably there. This is a DTPS scan of that uh, particular patient showing a pro proper drainage post-procedure at the end of three months. A similar scenario of a pelvirotic junction stricture now in a young male who had had a calculus five years back, but <clears throat> who had had symptoms since one month. Uh, but you have a large kidney with a relatively smaller pelvis, but a lower calyx that is hydro uh, showing a, a huge dilatation with, without any parenchyma over it. This is the DTP of that patient showing a significant uh, retained function, though it is an overestimation. Here, the deciding factors are you've got a short segment stricture at the level of the PUJ and a large dilated lower calyx with a thinned out parenchyma over it. Hence, a side a side to side anastomosis of the ureter to this lower uh, pole parenchyma uh, over, over the calyx is being pla planned. Basically, a ureter calicostomy with a side to side anastomosis. Because you don't have a, a large balloon dot pelvis to do a, a regular uh, pilo ureterostomy. That is a thin dot lower calyx being exposed. Spatulation of the ureter laterally so that when left freely, it faces the incised lower calyx. That is a lower calyx which is thinned out, looks like a pelvis. Longitudinal incision being given, sufficiently long enough to approximate and come close to the ureter here. The rest of the suturing is similar to a pyloplasty. 
parapagal sutures of the ureter to the lower end of the uh, incision onto the lower calyx. This is the posterior wall suturing of the ureter calicostomy. Stunt being placed and then closure of the anterior wall of the ureter calicostomy. One more scenario of a pelvic uretic junction stricture, but in this case, a young male who had under who has who is a known case of a chronic calcific pancreatitis, who had undergone a iatrogenic injury at the level of the pelvic uretic junction with a urinoma anterior to the pelvis. He has undergone a celiac plexus block, block for a pain abdomen persistent because of this calcific pancreatitis. He presented with pain abdomen and vomitings. On imaging, there is a urinoma anteriorly. Uh, to this renal pelvis on the right side. Hence, a PCN was placed and a nephrostogram showed a total cutoff at the level of the renal pelvis and hardly the pelvis was seen. Only calyxes were clear, clearly delineated. And at the end of three weeks, an RGP with a, a nephrostogram is being done and one can see there is a loss of the upper ureter as well as the renal pelvis with a, with a fairly functioning renal uh, unit. So here we have got a long segment stricture at the level of the PUJ and upper ureter. Dense periuretic fibrosis. Neither can the kidney be mobilized nor the ureter can be mobilized much. All the structures are fixed because of this celiac plexus block and a urinoma there. Hence a robotic ureter calicostomy was planned in this case. Colon was mobilized. The ureter was identified and cranially dissected till we reach the lower pole. An attempt was made to dissect the renal hilum, but it was met with a lot of fibrosis. So that is the proximal part of the ureter confirmed with a ureteric catheter in situ, a free flow of saline being seen, a renal hilum being dissected, and minimal mobilization of the proximal ureter is being done. Renal distances partly is being performed so as to have a tension-free repair at the level of the lower calyx. A Satinsky clamp is placed across the hilum. That is a marking of the lower parenchymal excision so that the lower calyx can be easily visualized. The thick parenchyma of the lower, lower pole is now excised till we reach the infundibulum of the lower calyx. That is the excised cap of parenchyma. The edges of the lower pole, cal lower, lower pole calyx is not very clearly seen. Hence, again a donut of parenchyma was excised so that the lower calyxial uh, opening can be seen very clearly. That is the papilla, which can which is excised so as to see the calyx comfortably. A few inner renorraphy sutures being taken to control the bleeders. And the edges are matured or everted so as to prevent any stricture at the level of the anastomosis. The outer renorraphy is commenced at one end till you reach the calyx of the lower pole. Again from the medial end till you reach the calyx, the ureter is spatulated posteriorly and the anastomotic sutures now being done using a 4-0 vicryl to the lower pole calyx. A stunt is being placed, pushed back into the renal pelvis from this calyx and those are the Interrupted sutures being placed in the rest of the anastomosis. The hilum is declamped. The renorraphy is again 
uh, nephropexy is now done to prevent any wobbling. This is a four. This is a four-month uh, IBP picture showing a fairly good drainage without any stress. Coming to few rare scenarios, we have seen uh, strictures at all levels of the ureter. Now, this is a rare scenario wherein an elderly male presented to us with a history of bilateral RARS for large upper ureteric calculi. He had raised creatinine requiring dialysis and he had undergone four to five sessions of dialysis and was uh, and, and a bilateral PCN was placed and he was referred to us. And this is the right-sided stricture of the upper ureter showing a long segment a narrowing and the left side is cut off at the level of the pelvic aortic junction. Beyond POJ, on a nephrostogram, there is nothing draining. So it's a bilateral obstruction with a long segment strictures on both the sides in an elderly male who had gone for a uretric uh, stone. So the deciding factors here are you've got a bilateral long uh, uretric strictures, small bladder capacity and a good function of both the kidneys. On the right side, we had planned for a appendiceal interposition. That is appendix being fixed at both the ends of this uh, structured segment, stent being placed and an ICG to confirm the vascularity of this appendix. You cannot show this video completely because you have planned to uh, present it at a conference. And this is a bladder capacity of this patient who has got a bilateral uretric injury. So you cannot plan a long bory flap also in this patient on the left side. Right side, we have put an appendix interposition. Left side, either it's a ileal interposition or an autotransplant. So three months later, he was planned for an autotransplant. This is a left-sided RGP, wherein uh, the lower uh, part of the ureter uh, is marked, putting an artery forceps. And this is a long segment of ureteric uh, stricture that is seen on the left side. Right side is in uh, appendix, left side, we have planned for an autotransplant since the bladder capacity is very small. Almost 10 to 12 centimeters of defect is seen in the upper ureter. And that is how uh, we marked on the abdomen to plan this. A laparoscopic nephrectomy was planned. An incision for retrieval and anastomosis simultaneously was planned before uh, the arteries and veins were uh, clipped. Until the peritoneum, uh, the incision was uh, carried on. This is a laparoscopic mobilization and uh, clipping and division of the upper ureter itself. That's the gonadal being clipped. That is a, a ureter that is clipped and divided. At this point, once the hilum is dissected, the hand is passed through the opening that we have already created so as to reach and deliver it from this peritoneal uh, opening. The left side kidney is harvested. Mm. And the kidney is then given for perfusion. The patient is kept in supine position and the ureter kept on, uh, we kept on uh, resecting the ureter till we reach the renal pelvis on the left side. Anastomosis of the artery was done to the external iliac artery and to the um, common iliac vein on the left side. That is a perfused kidney being seen uh, um, pouring out urine. So this completes all the uh, scenarios of multiple levels of ureteric strictures uh, that I have. I'm open for any questions or comment from the August gathering. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. Uh, question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very nice presentation with very good videos. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Gauss, in your experience, uh, how much of uh, of a of a uh, of a length do you feel it can be bridged uh, before you would recommend uh, something like ileal replacement? And uh, would you would you consider a upper ureteric structure a more or less uh, uh, more difficult if it is a long segment rather than a lower ureter where you can actually mobilize the uh, the bladder? 
Absolutely, sir. Well said. Lower ureter, uh, it's we have a bladder just next to the lower ureteric structure, so we can always have a ureteric reimplant or a small uh, bori flap uh, for the lower ureters. Definitely, an upper ureteric uh, structure or a narrowing is a challenging task, and uh, I would always prefer to do, uh, you know, <clears throat> not to involve the bowel uh, in any ureteric uh, reconstruction, so as to prevent any uh, bladder uh, any, any bowel complications. Rather, always use the urinary system itself. Provided the bladder capacity is sufficient enough to reach on a on a regular cystogram at least till the pelvic brim. If if we have a bladder capacity that is reaching on a pelvic brim, uh, that actually once take uh, once a flap is taken can reach the renal pelvis comfortably. Twelve to fifteen centimeters is the distance between the uh, iliac uh, spine till the renal pelvis, and similar is the distance between the iliac crest till the uh, pubic symphysis. So. Uh, 12 to 15 centimeters of gap can be uh, comfortably bridged with a long bori flap whenever it is being planned with a good bladder capacity. Yes, sir, Arvind, sir, any, 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 anything more? That is a question from the audience about ICG study. Uh, would, you, would you consider uh, ICG study to be, uh, it's a very interesting thing, but I haven't seen any real, real publication on ICG uh, for 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 structure. Yes, sir. Now that we uh, have an ICG even in laparoscopy and in uh, robotic as a tile pro, it can comfortably be used in any case wherever you uh, plan to have a good vascular uh, uh, flap. In this case, we had used an appendix, and uh, um, appendix were very well vascularized at the end of the procedure, and we were rest assured that it's going to drain this uh, segment of the ureter comfortably. And even if it's a bori flap, if you give an ICG and at the end of the procedure, if it is bleeding on a naked eye inspection, or if you have an ICG and you can show that the ICG is very well perfused uh, in that part of the flap, you can be rest assured that the anastomosis is going to be without a stricture. Also a question about uh, a tubularized BMG. So uh, what is your opinion about uh, long-term? Uh, we haven't had a case wherein uh, circumferentially, we have placed a tubularized BMG. Rather, we have always augmented on one of the walls, not the entire ureter circumferentially. It is always prudent to have one of the walls at the native ureter without dividing its vascularity and to only patch the BMG on one of the walls, either be it a posterior wall if you are doing a retroperitoneoscopic approach or an anterior wall if you are doing a transperitoneal approach. Transperitoneally, you can have the gerotasphasia and the perinephric fat for its vascularity or an omental wrap. If it is done being posteri done posteriorly, you can place it onto the psoas muscle that itself can be a very well vascularized bed for it. Uh, yes. So, are there any questions uh, from the from the August faculty? Uh, I'll just see if there are any more questions. So, uh, okay, the, uh, so it's a very nice presentation and we, we all are uh, educated. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Gauss. If, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I'll just ask uh, Dr. Gauss for some uh, closing comments. And then any any other closing comments uh, from the faculty, Dr. House? Any any closing comments from you? Any any take home message that you want to give us regarding this? Yes, sir. Basically, uh, the uh, rampant use of lasers in the ureter is what uh, is giving rise to all these uh, scenarios of multiple structures at all levels. Especially when we have we have seen recently this bilateral uh, ureteric structure long segment in an elderly male who has got a good renal function pre surgery. His creatinine was 0 0.9 and he presented with uh, creatinine 10 with bilateral obstruction on a PCN just because he was attempted for with an RIRS for a large ureteric stones bilaterally. So that is one thing that I would like to bring, uh, you know, to, to notice to all this uh, members August ga gathering here that in, you know, um, in, you know, the use of a laser without any indication rather than we would have done a proper mini perk or a PCNL and cleared these stones 
and landing up in such a big problem for this uh, patient and he's still in the ICU now he's yet to discharge and um, that's what uh, I feel all this discussion happened just because of this endo endo-urological procedures that we have done for all these patients. Now this is a compilation that I've got for the last five, six years in this institute. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's something we need to remember is that we need to use laser for the correct indications <clears throat> and not always a very large uh, or large stones because all of us are seeing increased incidence of stricture with the use of the uh, newer lasers, which generate a significant amount of heat. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I would invite Doc, uh, Dr. Chavla, uh, Professor Patwardhan. Madam, are you, can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gauss. It was uh, indeed a very nice presentation and you covered everything. Uh, I think uh, only to make the presentation complete, there, there are instances when we would keep the patient on uh, a urethrostomy, aeronectrostomy, permanent necrostomy. I have encountered such situations where there was no other option. And, uh, of course, it's not the right uh, way anybody would like to go ahead, but there are certain instances when you can't offer any other options. Uh, yeah. But anyway, very nice presentation and entire compilation of all the variety which is <laughs> normally taught to all the students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arvind. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. And good night to everyone. Thank you, madam, and thank you, Dr. Gauss, for, for this uh, wonderful illuminating presentation. Uh, we had a very, very good gathering of more than 50 uh, listeners today. Thank you once more, and uh, we hope to see you again uh, shortly, all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thanks for this opportunity and uh, where I could present all the compilation that I had. Looking forward for uh, future uh, collaborations, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you, madam. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Gauss. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, sir.